talking today about governing the software commons. Um, so I'll, just a little brief bio of me. My name's Shauna Gordon McKeon. I've been a member of the free software community for about five, six, seven years now. Uh, I do a lot of work uh, in scientific and civic communities. Um, yeah, so I'm excited. I'm excited to talk about our free software projects, our free software community, and how we manage and govern it. So let's just dive right into it. So here, who here has heard the phrase tragedy of the commons? Most people, right? So the tragedy of the commons is when people put their individual short-term interest ahead of the long-term interest of the community. And this, the sort of classical example of this is a literal commons where you have a field and you have farmers, presumably you know, dairy farmers of some kind, they're bringing their cows to the field and they have an incentive to let the cows eat all they want, but if everybody does that, then the commons gets overgrazed, all the grass dies out, all the cows die out, all the dairy farmers die out, it's, a, it's bad news. And this pattern does seem to appear in a lot of different social problems. Probably the biggest one facing us right now is global warming. So it's in the short-term interests of companies and governments to release greenhouse gases into the air, but if they keep doing that, the commons as a whole suffer, so we get catastrophic climate change, millions of people having to leave where they live, a refugee crisis, terrible news, etc. So what does this have to do with free software? Well, many of you have probably heard the word commons used to refer to free software and to similar sort of open shared content like academic articles or pictures or any sort of content where it's easily copyable. People tend to use the language of commons around that, and the Creative Commons uses it explicitly. And so if, if free software is a commons, is it subject to the tragedy of the commons? Well, before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit more about the history of the term tragedy of the commons. So it was popularized in a 1968 article in Science by a man named Garrett Hardin. He wrote, <laughs> ruin is the destination towards which all men rush each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. Freedom in a commons brings ruin to all. Which is, you know, kind of dramatic. Um, and I, th I think that probably a lot of people in this room sort of instinctively disagree that freedom of the commons brings ruin to all. But maybe, maybe you and probably a lot of people you know probably think, well, humans are kind of selfish and we want to be realistic about the fact that humans are selfish and they're going to pursue their own best interest. So this is another quote from that same article in the 1968 article in Science. Freedom to breed is intolerable. To couple the concept of freedom to breed with the belief that everyone born has an equal right to the commons is to lock the world into a tragic course of action. If we love the truth, we must openly deny the validity of the universal declaration of human rights. So it turns out Garrett Hardin is a white supremacist. He was an anti-immigration activist. He was a supporter of the idea that uh, black people have inherently lower IQs. Um, he was basically just not a nice guy with a really toxic value system. And my point in bringing this up is not to say that just because a white supremacist believes something, it means it's wrong, but... <laughs> But I think that when a white supremacist believes something, it's important to think about why they're supporting this. And I think, to me, the sort of belief in the inevitability of the tragedy of the commons and white supremacy and things like anti-immigration activism come from a place of fear and come from a belief that everyone is inherently selfish and therefore we need to do everything we can to protect our own and the people like us. And I you know, categorically reject that kind of thinking. Um, and so I think that part of what we need to do uh, as a community is to set forth a positive vision of hopefulness that says, yeah, sometimes people are selfish, but we can also be incredibly selfless. Um, so with that sort of background, if we don't believe that the tragedy of the commons is inevitable, well, how do we manage our commons? And a person who spent a lot of time thinking about this is a woman named Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, she was the, an, a, a prize winner, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, 
in economics for her work on this topic. She's actually the only woman uh, to win a Nobel Prize in economics, a diversity problem that the free software community is familiar with. Uh, so she wrote a book, her magnum opus, Governing the Commons. It's a fantastic book. I recommend that everyone read it, in which she studied a number of what she called common pool resources, over a dozen of them, stretching from 800-year-old Swiss villages that managed the common lands around them to a more modern example of Southern California water reservoir system. So she looked at a bunch of different systems, and she looked for patterns that made those commonses successful and for patterns that made other commonses not successful. Uh, so she talked, she, she referred to commonses as common pool resources. And her definition of a common pool resource is a natural or man-made resource system that is sufficiently large to, as to make it costly but not impossible to exclude potential beneficiaries from obtaining benefits for its use. And when I look at this, this seems like a natural fit for free software, which is a man-made resource system that is costly but not impossible to exclude potential beneficiaries from obtaining benefits from its use. And you're probably thinking, Shauna, what are you talking about? The whole point of free software is that the code is freely licensed. Everyone can use it. You can't exclude people from those benefits. To which I say, the code is not the only benefit that a free software project provides. Free software projects provide social communities for its participants and social relationships. It is a source of reputation and therefore a source of economic uh, and financial gain if reputation is used to get work. It is a source of meaning and purpose in people's life, which is perhaps the most important value anything can provide. It is a source of user support and user training. It is a resource that people can use to get features added that they want to see added and to fix bugs that are bothering them. It is infrequently, if you're lucky, it is a exquisitely managed project management system. So there's all sorts of things that a free software project is beyond just a snapshot of the code at any particular point in time. And so I encourage you to think about holistically about what a free software project is. How many people have heard this come up in a conversation yeah, that's, that's, that's most hands. So the phrase, don't like it, just fork it, sort of buys into this assumption that what's important about a free software project is its code. And if that was true, as soon as there was any sort of conflict in a community, you would see forking. There'd just be forks everywhere. But actually, it's relatively rare for forks to happen. It only happens when things have gotten pretty bad or there's a pretty big divergence in direction. Um, and that's because when you're actually working on a project, you see the value beyond the code itself. Um, I had something else I wanted to add here. Maybe I'll remember it later. Um, oh, right. So you can, another way that you can see this holistic value of free software projects is that a number of projects that do have financially successful models, um, for instance, something like WordPress, they release their code same as any other free software project. What they charge for is access to customization, to customer support. Uh, and some projects do, uh, they provide charges for access to using the software and like providing it as a service. Um, so many of the models for free software that do work are ones that are explicitly approaching and saying we, there's additional value that's not just in the code itself. So with that in mind, let's dive into the eight principles that Eleanor Ostrom came up with when she was studying common pool resources. So the first principle is that those who have rights to withdraw resources from a common pool resource must be clearly defined, as must the boundaries of the CPR itself. So if you believe that a free software project is just its code, you say, OK, well, the boundary is the license on who can use, modify, adapt, and share the code, and the answer is everyone. Great, we're all done here. But if you think of a free software project as being more than just the code, it creates more spaces to draw boundaries. So if a free software project is also a social space, who gets to be in that social space and participate in that social space? If it's a user support system, who gets access to have their user support questions answered? Who gets access to training? If it is a 
don't remember what the other thing I was going to say. If it's, uh, so, but if you think of it in a different way, you have different options for the boundaries that you draw. And uh, some people, when you talk about drawing boundaries, you might think, oh, but I'm drawn to free software because I love the idea of being part of an open community where there's not gatekeepers or people like relying on credentials to judge people. And I think that it's important to clarify that a common pool of resources, the boundaries aren't drawn based on people's identity. They're drawn based on people's behavior. And so this is precisely what something like a code of conduct does. A code of conduct says, we are open to anyone who behaves in line with our standards. But as long as you behave in line with our standards, you are welcome into this community no matter who you are. Um, and I think that this key distinction can help us have open communities, have projects where we nevertheless create, where we nevertheless are able to say, this is the type of behavior, this is the type of direction that we want to draw in, while still maintaining our egalitarian and open principles. Oh yeah, that's what that slide was gonna be about. Great. So the next, the next principle, rules in use are well matched to local needs and condition. So a moment here to talk about rules in use. So rules in use can be an explicit, you know, stated part of like a code of conduct. But there's a number of rules about who can do what that happen without us even thinking about them. So for instance, you might have a rule in use that says, uh, that in practice says like this set of people can push to production. And it's because those people have, they know what the password is. Uh, or you might have a rule that says only this person can edit our blog posts. And it's maybe not something you've explicitly thought about, but it's because the uh, content management system you're using gives them uh, access control. Um, or, what's another one? Uh, so, so it can be explicit, but it's, it's often implicit. Um, oh, another example is the right to participate in road mapping. So you might have explicit rules about who gets notified of a, uh, you might say like, oh, we have a steering council or like a tech team and they, you get on it this way or that way. But another project, the way this is determined might be just whoever the founder of the project is like having beers with and chatting with about the project's future. Uh, and so it can be implicit, it can be explicit. I tend to be in favor of making things as explicit as possible in the interest of transparency, but no matter what, there's always going to be some elements of rules that you're just not gonna think of as rules, but nevertheless, they have the function of rules. So, and so it's important to, every project is different. It's important to, to the extent you can think explicitly about rules and try to match them to your needs. So learn, learn from other projects, use templates, use guides, but don't do so unthinkingly. Match them, adapt them to your needs. Rule number three. Individuals affected by these rules can usually participate in modifying the rules. So you might say people affected by the rules. You might say they're users of the rules. Users with the right to modify the rules. Sounds familiar, right? So the reason why we think that, well, the reason why I think that people who are software users should have the right to modify that software is because the user knows best what they need to use that software for. So if they want to change it to fit their needs, they know better than some stranger who made the software whenever or wherever it was made. Um, and sort of similarly with a rule system, with a governance system, you don't want to have all the rules made by someone who's so far away from the actual rules of use on the ground that they can't make changes when the rules cause problems. And the rules are gonna cause problems, just like software is inevitably full of bugs, so are governance systems. Like, you're gonna make decisions about how the project should work, how the governance system should work. It's gonna be wrong and you need a way to change it. So tying that to the person and the people who are most affected, it, affected by it is a key part of free software and it's a key part of any sort of democratic system. Rule number four, behavior is monitored 
And monitors are accountable to the people whose behavior they're monitoring. So this is a combination of two of my favorite cliches. Uh, rules don't enforce themselves, because they don't, and who watches the watchmen? So it's this, uh, the importance that there are, that people's compliance with rules is monitored and enforced, but also that that monitoring and enforcement is itself made accountable. And a project that I think does this really well is Public Lab. So Public Lab is a community science project, uh, uses free software, uses free hardware, and um, I was talking to Jeff Warren, who's one of the co-founders of Public Lab, about their code of conduct system. And their code of conduct system has a three-part notification system, where when someone commits a violation, the person, the monitor, the moderator, has to notify three parties. They have to notify the individual who made the violation uh, in private, give them a chance to talk through what happened, get some context. They need to notify the place where it happened so that the community understands that a violation happened and that it's being, it was noticed and it's being dealt with by the moderators. And then third, they have to notify the other moderators so that the other moderators can give feedback, maybe let the person know if they disagree with the moderator's decision, give them advice, emotional support, et cetera. And the result of this system is that the code of conduct there's a lot of transparency and therefore knowledge in the community. So when you have these like really minor violations or things that almost maybe aren't violations, but they're kind of not great, the community says, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know that this is in line with our code of conduct. I don't know it's in line with our values. And it's sort of dealt with right away by the community. So there's a very small number of violations that sort of get worse and bubble up to the point where they actually need to be addressed by moderators. And because there's so few of them, the moderators have the time and emotional energy to deal with them. So it's this kind of like virtuous cycle where actually they have virtually no code of conduct violations anymore. Um, and uh, Ostrom's book, and she talks about different ways that monitoring systems can be set up to encourage virtuous cycles. She gives an example of a uh, irrigation rotation system where in order to limit irrigation, people were given set periods of time, and the next person who came to use the irrigation sort of naturally enforced the time limit on the previous person. So there was a natural monitoring of people on each other, um, so it meant that uh, there was uh, not a sort of separate enforcer who was constantly trying to find enforcements that were difficult, uh, find violations that were difficult to see. So. Five, uh, people who violate rules are assessed graduated sanctions depending on the seriousness and context of the offense. A lot of people think that, oh, the fairest thing to do is just to always punish everyone the same for the same violation, but context is actually really important. Um, Ostrom gives the example of a community that had a forest that they were communally managing, and the community fell on hard times, and there were some members of the community that were in really desperate economic circumstances, and they started going into the woods at night to log in violation of the community norms. And the people who were there to monitor the forests saw them and turned the other way because they knew that the people who were doing it, it was a matter of life and death for them. And they respected the fact that these people were just trying to survive. And by giving grace and that understanding of context, the people who were committing the violations were motivated to get to, st to get to the point where they could stop committing the violations as soon as possible and get back to being a member of good standing in the community because they knew the community understood and valued them and they wanted to rejoin it. Um, so, that's another example. Principle six, uh, members have access to low-cost arenas to resolve conflicts. This one's pretty straightforward, um, so I'm not gonna spend much time on it. Uh, principle seven, the right of appropriators to devise their own institutions are not challenged by external government authorities. And so when Ostrom talks about this, she spends, she's mostly focused on the state that uh, exists and the sort of power and authority that they grant to the local community to devise their own system. And notes that when uh, the external state doesn't give them that authority, that's a frequent cause of commonses devolving and not, not being able to be managed anymore. And but I think it's important to note that the like, government force, government authority, is not the only sort of external pressure that can be 
um, pushed on a community. And I think in the free software community, there's definitely a sort of trope or cliche or feeling that excluding people from a community makes you not open or not free. And that making money off of a free software project makes you greedy or corrupt. And I think that this type of language can disincentivize projects from drawing the boundaries that they need in order to make those projects work. So if that's something you sort of lean towards, I'd encourage you to like think more carefully about your language and just make sure that it's actually what you want to convey. Finally, principle eight, boundaries, enforcement, conflict resolution, et cetera. These are organized in multiple layers of nested enterprises. And this is sort of in line with the um, earlier principle about customizing to local needs because projects can get pretty big and even within the project, you might have different areas that need different governance. And so being able to nest your governance while maintaining these other principles of self-governance, of customization, of access to conflict resolution, et cetera, enables you to handle that complexity. Cool, so that's the eight principles. So let's start talking about some specific free software projects uh, and use these eight principles to uh, to do so. So I'm going to start with Debian. Are there any Debian developers in the room? Excellent, excellent. So I am actually relatively unfamiliar with Debian. I'm going to do my best not to actively mislead you. If I do, it will be accidental. Uh, but if there are any Debian developers in the room, please don't interrupt me. But please also feel free at the end to be like, hey, that thing you said about Debian was wrong. Because uh, hopefully nothing's wrong. I'm going to do my best. OK, so Debian is one of the oldest and most popular Linux distributions. Uh, it has over 50,000 packages. Fun fact I got from its website. Um, and it's got a really cool, unique governance structure that I think is worth delving into. So I found this chart on Wikipedia. Uh, as far as I know, it's correct. Uh, but it's nice and simple. And it sort of gets at the basic structure where you have so you have the Debian community is wider than just Debian developers. Um, but Debian developers have governance rights that people who are not Debian developers do not. So you have a community of developers. And they have a fair amount of autonomy over their individual packages they maintain. But they also elect the project leader who's responsible for handling if there's areas of overlap or conflict or maybe areas where there is no uh, Debian developer, and so the responsibility sort of would fall through the cracks otherwise. So they elect the project leader, and the project leader can delegate some of their powers to individuals they appoint. But there's a couple of neat customizations here that I think are really cool. One is that there's certain things that the project leader actually has to delegate their powers for. So for instance, in order to expel a Debian developer from the community, they have to have a delegate do that. The, Lead, project leader themselves can't do it. And this is explicitly called out in the Constitution. They say, we did this because we don't want too much power concentrated in the hands of one individual. Another thing they did is they said, uh, if a project leader's delegate does something that the project leader disagrees with, the project leader can replace the delegate, but that doesn't undo the decision that was made. The decision has to stand. Um, and so I think these are a couple of you know, clearly thought through um, well thought out. Um, they were worried about certain implications of the system, so they tweaked the system to make sure that, or at least to try to make sure that um, things wouldn't go wrong in the way that they were worried that it would. So I think the most interesting part to me of how Debian works, though, is how the Debian developer system happens. So like I mentioned, you don't have to be a Debian developer to contribute. Uh, in fact, you can maintain packages without being a Debian developer. But uh, there's a lot of privileges and access that comes with being a Debian developer. And their website says, you know, this position requires a great deal of trust and commitment. And consequently, the process by which you become a Debian developer is very strict and thorough. And so it's got like several parts. It involves, you know, verification with uh, public key signing. It involves learning a specific subset of skills. It involves maintaining packages for, I think, at least six months. Uh, one of my favorite parts is it requires you to show that you understand Debian values. 
Um, and many people do this by writing an essay about what the Debian social contract means to them, which I think is great. Um, and so this is like a really great example of a project that is drawing a, a significant boundary uh, so that those who cross that boundary show that they share values, they share commitment. And I don't know if anyone studied the like comparative uh, stick to itiveness of Debian developers versus contributors to other projects, but I'm willing to bet that they stick around longer than the average. So another project I want to talk about is Python. If you're interested in Python governance, I'm actually giving a whole talk on Python governance at PyCon this year. Um, I'm going to try to cut down my like half an hour talk to like a five minute five minute thing here. Do my best. So Python's a programming language. Probably know that it's actually the third most popular programming language after Java and C. And it's been around for almost 30 years. It's having a birthday soon. Fun fact, fun fact. In 2000, Guido Van Rossum, who's the creator of Python, uh, licensed Python with a license that said it was uh, authorized through the state of Virginia, or there's some specific language that made it not GPL compliant. And the Free Software Foundation reached out and was like, hey, Guido, we don't know if you meant to do this, but uh, this is no longer GPL compliant. Would you consider relicensing the code to be GPL compliant? And Guido was like, sure. This is, like, I'm paraf like, I was not actually there. This is what I imagine happened. Uh, and so he, re he relicensed it after the uh, FSF reached out. Uh, and then next year, he won uh, the FSF uh, Software Award, uh, which heads up. This year's awards are happening in just a few hours at the end of the conference day down the hall. So see you there. Okay, so up until very recently, um, the head of Python was Guido Van Rossum, the founder. Um, and I'm just gonna take a second to explain how up until very recently the Python community works. We're not gonna go through this in detail, but the sort of basics of it is that there's really two elements to the Python community. The um, part that's run by the PSF, the Python Software Foundation, which manages the intellectual property uh, and also does a lot of community work. They run PyCon, they help run other conferences and meetups, sorry, community focused. And the PSF is a sort of traditional nonprofit. It's got a board, it elects a president. The president is Guido Van Rossum. Uh, but, you know, he doesn't own it because it's a nonprofit, so it's community owned. Uh, and the Python community has, uh, you can become a member in five different ways. Um, there's the basic membership where literally you just say, hey, I want to be a member, and then Python's like, sure, great. Uh, but there's also supporting members, which are people who donate, contributing and managing members, which are people who contribute either to the language, to the community in some way. And you also have fellows who are nominated by peers to, uh, to be sort of lifetime members. And... Basic members, who again don't have to do anything other than say they want to be members, are non-voting members. But the other four types of members vote. So you might say, oh, well, the supporting members are kind of like buying the right to vote. And that's true. You know, they don't have to do anything else other than donate $100 a year. But $100 a year is not that much. You can only buy it for yourself. It's not like you can be a company and buy like 10,000 memberships, you know, $100 each, and then use your money to have disproportionate sway. Um, and there's these alternate routes into having voting memberships if you can't afford the $100 a month. And so there is a barrier of investment um, that promotes people donating without giving people a sort of disproportionate sway. Another interesting thing that the PSF does is you have to, if you want to use your vote, you have to declare your intention to vote at the beginning of the year. So if you just decide in like September that you want to vote this year, it's too late. You have to have the intentionality from the beginning of the year. And then if you declare your desire to vote and then don't maintain by voting in one in every four, at least one in every four votes, then you lose your right to vote for the rest of the year. And this is, I'm not actually entirely sure how I feel about this model, but it's a really interesting decision that's clearly aimed at promoting engagement and saying, if you want to have a say in the community, you need to be actively engaged throughout. So I think that's pretty interesting. So in any case, the PSF has not changed at all, but there's been a big change over on the other side of the Python community, which is the, what, I, what I will call the language itself. I, as far as I can tell, it doesn't have a single term to encompass it. So previously, uh, people could contribute. A set of people were called core developers, and 
they became core developers by being invited by the current core developers and getting a vote of the current core developers. And the core developers do their development in large part through something called Python enhancement protocols or proposals or PEPs. And PEPs govern language design decisions, but also project governance infrastructure decisions. Um, and Guido historically had the power to accept or reject PEPs that were proposed, although he could delegate his powers to an individual. And again, you see the idea of a delegate that a, uh, so that people are able to use their expertise, but the authority fundamentally rested in Guido. But last year, there was a very contentious debate over a particular PEP, and once it was all over, Guido was like, I'm going to resign as benevolent dictator for life. Uh, you guys figure out what you want to do next. So that led to the question, well, who is going to govern the project? Uh, which led to the question, well, uh, what governance model do we even want to use? Uh, which led to the question, well, how do we even decide what governance model we want to use? And it's like, it's just like layer upon layer. Uh, so this is, this is what they ended up doing. So the first step was deciding how they were going to decide what the governance model was going to be. Uh, and if you go to PEP 8001, you will see that they say, okay, guys, we had a meeting. We had a core developer sprint. Uh, and then we also had a discussion on uh, python.discuss.org for people who couldn't make it to the sprint. And we talked a lot about it, and we came up with this. This is our plan. And their plan was people could submit proposals for how the project was going to be governed via PEPs. And then they would use a specific voting message, which is outlined in 8001. It's like, you know, oh, it's like a Condorcet system. It's going to use like this uh, website, et cetera. Lays out all the details. Uh, and so once they got that settled, they're like, okay, well, what will the governance model be? So then if you look at PEP 8002, PEP 8002 is the open source governance survey. So members of the community just looked at a bunch of different projects and asked what their governance models were and how it was working out for them. And then there's a whole bunch of PEPs that are different proposals from members of the community about how the project should be run. And so they held their election and they picked PEP 8116, the steering council model. And they held their election in January, so the first steering council has been elected and their system has worked. Um, and so what you see here is there's multiple levels of decision making that are having to happen at the same time. So, or, or close to the same time. It's not just a single simple question. You not only have to decide who's gonna have power, but also how they're gonna have power and you still have to decide how you're gonna decide. And at a certain point, you basically just have to be like, can we just like all agree on X and hope for the best? And with the Python community, it was helpful that you, it's a longstanding project. You have systems and people who are already trusted. You can sort of pressure people to coalesce around something. So you have the PSF, you have Guido, who is still like respected. It's not like he like got hit by a bus or like got forced out because everyone hated him. Like you have these resources that can push people to just come to a consensus around like whatever that basic, uh, the basic structure is going to be. Um, and so Ostrom talks about this a lot, and she calls these sort of earlier foundational steps institutional choice, which is different from the sort of operational rules that govern a project on a day-to-day -day basis. But both of them need to be come uh, addressed through self-governance. Uh, there is uh, no need to actually go into the details. Great. So what strikes me about Python is Python really prioritizes investors. And by that, I don't just mean people who give money, but people who invest time, energy, skill, attention, interest into the community. Uh, in PEP 8001, the one that outlined the whole decision-making process, there's a line that says, we are asking core developers to self-select based on whether the governance situation will affect them directly. Uh, so it's, and that's directly related to principle three, that people should be able to um, to change the rules that affect them. It's saying the people who are most affected by this should have the most say. And they used a sort of honor system to uh, sort of pressure people into following that. And you see a sort of, sort of similar with the PSF where 
in order to actually have a voting membership, you need to contribute in some way, whether that's financially or with skill. Um, and the time investment to stay active as a voter. Uh, you'll also see, if you look at the PEP that got chosen, the steering model that got chosen, they say that they copy shamelessly from the Django Project's governance model. Uh, it also seemed that they were inspired by the Jupiter Project's governance model. In the Jupiter Project was the steering council option in the open source governance survey. Um, so they're not inventing things from scratch. They're using knowledge that already exists in the community, but they also, you know, they also make customizations. There's a, uh, a rule about the number of people who are employed by the same employer who could be on the steering council that's not in Django's governance, it's not in Jupiter's governance as far as I could tell. Um, and so it was the Python community saying, oh, maybe we wanna worry about the appearance of conflict of interest, maybe more so than other projects were worried about it. I'm gonna do this one really quick because I got my 10 minute sign. Uh, so the Carpentries are a, um, a project that tries to do software training for academics, or at least that's their source. They've sort of spun out in so many different directions. And they've got a number of different uh, communities around the individual lessons that they work on. And if you look at their governance model, they have rules for, they basically say, each lesson program should meet these minimum standards of governance, but then within that, you have the ability to customize to your sort of mini community's needs. Um, and so it's an example of nested governance, an example of nested governance structure, where the carpentries themselves have good self-governance in line with the eight principles, but also the individual lesson programs within have that, um, have that as well. I'm just gonna skip that one because I'm running out of time. Oh, no, I'm not. All right, so Mapbox is not itself a free software project, but they have something like 600 uh, free software repositories. I don't know what percentage of software that goes into their services that they offer online are, uh, like how much of that software is uh, free versus proprietary, but they are at least participants in the free software community. But actually what I found interesting was their terms of service, which include an item that say you cannot use the service to uh, create databases of identifying information for any government to abrogate any human rights, civil rights, or civil liberties of individuals on the basis of race, gender, or gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, or natural origin, which is not something I have seen in a terms of service before. And in fact, I'm so used to thinking of terms, terms of service as this like long, difficult to read thing that's just gonna take a whole bunch of rights away from me, but I have to sign anyway because everyone's already using this godforsaken platform and I just feel pressured into it and I have so very negative like associations with terms of service. But here's an example of an organization drawing a boundary and saying we don't want to, we wanna minimize the, our participation in this negative thing, so here's a boundary we're drawing. And it's not around their code, it's around the services they provide related to the code. Okay, so those are some examples of some individual free software projects um, and how they function as a commons. But the free software community as a whole can be considered as a commons. Um, yeah. And there are ways in which we interact as a commons. So there are cross-project or uh, Meta, meta projects like the Free Software Foundation, the Open Source Initiative. There are efforts like Outreachy. Um, uh, the company Stripe does semi-regular open source retreats um, where they pay people to work on open source projects. There's things like the Software Freedom Conservancy, the Open Invention Network that provide legal support. Uh, the Linux Foundation, a couple, I think about a couple years ago now, started something called the Core Infrastructure Initiative to address core infrastructure that was being under-resourced. So there are things that we're doing to uh, work together collectively. Um, and there are also sort of interesting patterns of individual projects or individual companies treating uh, the free and open source community as a community and saying, you know, we're gonna give you our services for free. You can see this all over the place. This took me like five minutes to compile. I just, you know, uh, I just um, did a DuckDuckGo search of you know, uh, open source, free for open source or free for free software. Uh, but, so these projects mostly say, you know, if you've got a particular license, you can use the service for free. 
but we don't necessarily have to draw that boundary. We could say, if you make commercial profits, you have to donate 1% of your profits to the Free Software Infrastructure Fund, uh, and then you get access to the services for free. Or we might say, you need to be an ethically tax certified, ethical tax certified company. Um, and what's key here is whoever is making those distinctions be a legitimate authority. What makes them a legitimate authority? Well, if you function according to the eight principles of commons governance, if there's uh, clear membership, if the members are the ones who are deciding the rules, if there's transparency and accountability around how it's enforced, that's where you can sort of say, okay, we're acting as a commons to encourage specific behaviors. And if we don't do that, people are just gonna look for some source of legitimacy. And so I found this project, uh, which says that people who are projects that adhere to best practices from a community perspective are also gonna be given extra access to their services. And I thought, well, I wanna click that link and see who's, def who's, who's defining best practices. It's open source guides, and it turns out the open source guides are created by GitHub. Uh, so in the absence of someone more legitimate saying this is what we want from our communities, we have GitHub saying it. And it's not surprising because GitHub is a really central source. It's uh, a lot, everyone knows about it. Not everyone uses it, but it's clearly a sort of uh, financial and reputational heavyweight in the space. But it's, it's just a company. They don't, have any, uh, they don't have any authority in the sense of the eight principles. They have an authority because they have money and financial success and they make a tool that people like to use, which is like not where I like, to, it's not the type of legitimacy I typically prefer. So, so I think that this should motivate us to think about, are we gonna see legitimate authority to GitHub or can we work collectively to provide an alternative? Commons management, if we can work together, we can address systemic problems like lack of resources for vital projects, lack of diversity in our communities, the use of free software for unethical purposes, all of these things that seem impossible to deal with as individuals, things we can address as a community, as a community. I know that some people think that a good, vibrant community comes about when you have a successful project. You know, some people think, no, 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 uh, a successful project comes about when you have like a cool and vibrant community. I agree with that more, but for me, I, about, I think about the community as the project. The community and the project are the same thing. They're inextricable. Um, we're all part of the free software commons, uh, and each of us, each and every one of you, is much more important and valuable than whatever code you happen to write. So we got a lot ahead of us, a lot of systemic problems to address but I'm really excited and glad to have you as part of this commons with me because I think we can work together to figure it out. Thank you. So we have like two minutes, three minutes, one minute, zero minutes, no minutes. Yeah, right. so unfortunately we have zero minutes, but. But I will hang out outside if people want questions and we can chat there. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Now is lunch. <laughs>